What's up, guys? So, hey, uh, Tech won yesterday, so that was cool. They, they should have won, but, but hey, that's a good start. It's a good start. We'll take every W we can get. Um, so we're in the middle of a series um, called Plagues. Um, we're looking at a lot of things that we deal with, a lot of issues that we go through. And how does God respond to those things? What does God have to say about the stuff that we deal with? And so um, we're in week two of that. Last week, we got to see that God, um, in John chapter four, he meets this woman in her deepest wound and her darkest sin, and he steps into that and he heals. And we could experience healing in Jesus. And this week, we're going to be in Exodus. We're going to be in the book of Exodus. Chapter 2 is where we're going to pick it up. If you don't have a Bible, um, if you have a Bible, I, I hope you do turn there. If you don't, it's going to be uh, behind us as we're going through uh, the scripture together. We're going to start in Exodus chapter 2. We're going to be going several places in, in Exodus um, as we go through the night. But uh, as you're turning there, um, who here has been mudding before? So you've been mudding before. Hey, there's a few of us. There's a few of us who here has not, just by a show of hands. So, so who has, who hasn't? So um, it looks like a little bit of a split room. I'm actually pretty surprised by that. Um, so uh, I had never been mudding whenever I was a junior in high school, and my parents, um, they took me to go buy a, a, a vehicle, and I was looking for a truck, and I saw that truck, you know, the one that you see, and you're just like, oh, my gosh, I hope that that one's within mama's price range because uh, because uh, she was the one that paid for this one and so uh, i was like man i really hope that that's within her price range and we get there i look at the price tag and i'm like even before the haggling starts it's already within the price range and i sit in the truck um and I, have you just had one of those feelings where you sit in a vehicle and you're like oh yeah this is it and so um, this truck had a six-inch Skyjacker lift on it, had a cattle guard on the front. It was a pretty decked out 2001 Dodge at this point in time. Um, that wasn't too old. Um, and, and so uh, this is whenever I was a junior in high school. And so um, I graduated in 06, just to give you all some you know, clarity on, on how much older I am than y'all. I am old. Okay, so... Uh, and, and so some of y'all are doing the math. You're like, oh, doesn't make you... Yeah, over 30, over 30. Okay, so... So I, I get this vehicle, and the only thing that was weird about it was uh, it came with stock tires. So I have this massive six-inch Skyjacker lift, and I'm riding around on, like, little donut holes. Um, and and I, I just had to deal with it because my mom said, listen, I'll get you this truck. I know what you're about to ask me. No, um, I'm not buying you the mud tires. You can ask for that for Christmas and your birthday. I'm a December 24th baby. So she said, we can join those bad boys together, and I'll get you the mud tires then. And so I'm riding around like a clown for, like, uh, a few months. But then I finally get the, the tires that I wanted, get some 33-inch mud tires, nothing crazy. Um, but uh, my friends, my friends, uh, I, I knew that there's several of them that went mudding, and they, they were like always going mudding. And I'd been with them a couple of, uh, of times um, after I got my truck just to kind of go out with them. And I was like, man, I can't wait till I get my tires because I'm going to come out here with you guys. Uh, for some reason, I thought the tires made a big difference. Um, but, uh, but I, and they do, but I still could have went mudding with them, um, even with the stock tires. But uh, I, I went out there after I got my, my uh, tires on my truck, and uh, they said, okay, now you, can, now you can come out with us. And we went to the same place that they always went. And, um, and at first, like, there's, as you're going into uh, where everyone was mudding, um, there's, like, the shallow mud where you kind of go there, and you just kind of do some uh, donuts, and you're kind of just sliding all over the place. And I'm just feeling like a boss, right? Like, I'm like, this is the most manly thing I've ever done. Uh, side note, I don't know why Mudding is so fun. Like, I, if you think about it, uh, it it's kind of weird. But, but with slinging all the mud all over my truck, and I was like, this is it. And, and so I'm doing the donuts. I think it's awesome. And then the guys say, hey, well, let's go a little, let's go into the actual place where um, you can actually go through some stuff that uh, gets a little bit more interesting. And, and so this is where there's like puddles, massive puddles that people are driving through that go like up. And I'm like, that has got to be going into their vehicle right now for how high it was going on some of these Jeeps in particular. I was like, what are they? doing. And then there was like these mud pits all over the place. Um, if y'all been mudding, y'all know kind of what I'm talking about. And so, and so I go in, uh, and, and then it happens. It's the rite of passage, right, for mudding. Um, so I'm going through all the mud pit, the same mud pit that everyone else went through. It was like the second one for me to go through. Uh, and on second, on the mud pit number two, um, everyone else was going through and said, oh, just, I just knew that you had to try to keep going. And if you pause in the middle of a mud pit, that's bad. Other than that, I had no idea what I was doing. And so I go, and sure enough, I get stuck. Okay, and so I get stuck. And it's at this moment, 
that uh, a couple of, uh, like another vehicle pulls up next to me and a couple guys who are just kind of showing me the reins on how to go mudding and things like that. They were in my car with me. And they decided that this would be a good time for them to talk through all of their adventures that they have had um, losing lots of money going mudding. Um, uh, and, and so one of them was like, oh man, yeah, I remember whenever I got stuck this one time and I slung all this mud all up in my engine, man, it cost me thousands. And I'm like, it cost you what? <laughs> I had no, I truly had no idea. And the other guy goes, oh yeah, dude, that's why you have to have, man, if, I did, if you don't have an underguard on your truck uh, then you, or your Jeep, you're pretty much toast. And I'm like, and under what? <laughs> I'm like, guys, did you know I think that that would have been imperative information to show me right before we got out here? Now I'm sitting here stuck, and I'm like, I'm thinking, okay, um, here I am. My truck's probably damaged now because uh, now they're telling me all these stories of how much they've had to pay and how much their parents hated them for it and all this stuff. And I'm going, okay, I'm stuck, and my truck is probably damaged. Now, I share that story or the beginning of that story because I, I, it's going to give us some uh, traction, pun intended. Get it? Because tires in the mud. <laughs> There's the dad joke for the night. But that gives us traction for where we're going tonight because we're going to be answering the question, how do I get unstuck? How do I get unstuck from what I am stuck in? And there's all kinds of ways that people get stuck in things, circumstances, sins, addictions of all kinds. And at first, what happens oftentimes is we, we are kind of, especially with sin, we kind of see it, it's kind of fun, and, and, and uh, then all of a sudden we end up going a little deeper into it. We find ourselves in a place that we didn't want to be, and we're spiritually stuck. Or we are addicted, just like Jake was sharing, and just like many people that we met with this week. They shared that they had addiction, that they were fighting through porn and all kinds of other things. And so we, we have all kinds of things that we get stuck in, but we're going to look at how do I get unstuck from addiction? How do I get unstuck from the unforgiveness that has a hold on me? How do I get unstuck from jumping into one bad relationship to the next bad relationship to the next bad relationship? There's something there for why we do that over and over again. And how do we get unstuck from just in general the things that have a hold on our lives? We're going to be looking at the book of Exodus, and we're going to see God comes to um, these Israelites who are enslaved, and he sets them free. And God, uh, it's a pointer going to the cross. All this is pointing to Jesus, but Jesus comes to us and he also sets us free. But man, after that moment of freedom, a moment of salvation where God has this breakthrough moment, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. But then it seems like it's just this grimy process of actually getting some of that stuff out of our lives, like Jake was sharing whenever he was sharing his story. And so what does that process actually look like? And we're going to see the process of being unstuck as we look through several places in Exodus in the story of God freeing these Israelites. So let's start in Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 23. We're going to read 23 through 25 together. It says, During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery. And they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. This is a beautiful passage that when God's response to them, whenever they cry out, how it comes up to God, God hears, and God is moving on their behalf, like we talked a little bit with the woman um, last week. But the first point is this, that you've got to cry out to God. How do you get unstuck? Cry out to God. This is where it starts with the Israelites, and it's where it's got to start with us. They're enslaved, and they want to get free. And so they cry out. Um, I have a friend um, years ago, it's a, it just an impactful moment for me um, with this guy. He had, uh, he had been coming to a Bible study that I was preaching at, and um, his name's Brandon, a really good friend of mine, grew up with him. Um, this is one of those guys that I just never saw the guy cry, like ever, in all of our childhood. Um, he's just really, really tough dude. Well, he calls me, he sounds like he, he's crying, and he says, hey, can you meet me? And this is kind of in the middle of the day. Uh, so I, I stop what I'm doing, because um, I, I was free, where I could get free enough where I could go meet him, and we met in a movie theater parking lot. And... Um, I got out of my car, got into his, and, and uh, he just started breaking down, talking about how his girlfriend and him had broken up, and they had been together for years, and now they were no longer together. It was just, uh, and quickly, what happened was that conversation shifted from us talking about him and his girlfriend breaking up to him and God. And he started to, he started to talk about how he had left Jesus. 
how he had faded away from God. And um, there, right there in his car, we, he said, man, I just want to come back. And then he looked at me and said, will you pray for me? And then uh, that's whenever I said to him, hey, why don't you cry out to God? And he broke down to God right there in, in, in that vehicle. And he said, God, through sobs, I'm sorry. I want to come back. I'm coming back now. Lord, will you please take me back? And he's had this, his, he had this breakthrough moment where his will was bowing to the will of God is what was happening in this moment. And uh, last week, there was uh, a few of you um, that came up and y'all chatted with me briefly. And then there's some of you that chatted with me and others um, throughout the week in one-on-one -on -one meetings and just uh, hanging out and things like that. But uh, uh, there was a couple people that came up to me and shared that they had had a breakthrough moment last week, that God had spoken. And uh, that there was one guy that said like, I, that he had grown up in church, um, that uh, he, he wanted to have God in his life and really pressed into the things of God um, a little while back, but he had just kind of faded. Can anybody resonate with that? He just kind of faded away from God and um, trying to fight back tears said, I just want to come back to what God has for my life. And maybe that's where you're at, but it starts with us crying out to God. And when we cry out, we can know this. What it says is that God heard them that God hears. God does not reject the prayer of desperation if you cry out to him. Um, in, in our hearts, sometimes we think, like, did I, was it one too many times that I fell back into it? Was it one too many times that uh, I said I wouldn't, and then I did, um, and now God, he, he doesn't care about me anymore, and uh, is God no longer listening to me? Um, is God wanting to help me? The answer is yes. God absolutely does, and uh, he wants to help you even tonight. And then it says that God remembers in this verse, so he remembered his covenant with Abraham. God had made a promise to Abraham that Abraham's descendants would be God's people and that they would be as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And so um, God made this promise to Abraham, and he was saying, I'm going to keep that promise. Uh, even though you are in slavery right now, I made a promise. I'm going to keep it. And so he comes to this people. And for us, God remembers the covenant made by Jesus Whenever he died on a cross and his blood was shed for us and his body was broken for us um, and all what that means, the covenant made by Jesus for us means that God looks on you and he looks on me and he's not angry and mad at us if we are believers. If we are believers in Jesus, we are not under the wrath of God because every bit of it, every ounce of it was squeezed out on Jesus when he was on the cross and he took it to the grave. And that's really, really, really good news for us because listen, many people who are stuck in things they, they have this shy, this thing that happens where they shy away from God because they think that, no, 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 God, God doesn't want me anymore. If, listen, if you believe that God is against you and he's not for you, you'll never be unstuck. And so it's so important for us to understand that. Um, one time I was... Uh, going um, to see some of my old friends that I used to party with and hang out with a lot and didn't hang out with them as much anymore, but still loved the people and wanted to see them. And, and so I went to go say hi to them. And apparently one of my friends uh, had told uh, some people that I was coming and told them that I was the preacher that he went and listened to and all, or whatever. Uh, and so when I walked in, um, there was this girl who was uh, apparently an exotic dancer um, because uh, uh, she, she goes, a stripper and a preacher in the same house. Like, that's literally my welcome into this house. And I was like, oh, this is awkward. Hello. Hello. Uh, I, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Um, also, I just want to be clear. She was not in the act of stripping either. Uh, just for, just scary. I don't want minds going crazy places, okay? And so, and so we start having uh, in a conversation, though, because uh, uh, she's, and it's really funny, too, because there's like probably seven or eight people in this particular room, and like several of them like move their beers behind them. They're like, oh, that's so cool. You know, like they move their drinks behind them because awkward moment. Um, but we started having a conversation, and I started to get to know her, didn't know her at all, and just uh, wanted to know why she made the statement like that when I walked in. And so in the conversation, one of the things that she said, because I, I invited her, I said, hey, come to the Bible study that I preach at. And she goes, oh, no, if I, if I went to the church, I think the walls would just fall in. And she said that, and it was kind of this light moment, but, man, there was so much packed into that statement. Because what she was saying is, is that there is no way that... I can come. There's no way that I'm not too far gone. That's what she believed. She believed that she was too far gone, and she wasn't, and neither are any of us. And I think sometimes it's good for us to say some things out loud, so I just want us to say this statement out loud. It's a basic statement, but will you just say, God wants to help me? 
And I'll say it again. God wants to help me. Welcome to Sinners Anonymous. We are in session. Um, and turn to your neighbor and just say, you need help. We did this last week. We do. The truth is, like, listen, like we, every person in here needs the help of the Lord. We need the help to continue walking in God's freedom or to get free from whatever it is that has a hold on our lives. God is here to help us. Jesus is our advocate. God hears the Israelites, and then he says, I'm going to set them free. He sends Moses on his behalf, and the exodus starts to begin, and um, all the plagues start to happen. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh, baby, let my people go. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're in church, you know that song. And so, you're not if you're in church, if you have grown up in church, I should say, um, but uh, all that starts to take place, but the truth is, God says, I'm going to set them free, and he comes and says to this, us as well that he's going to set us free, but the process is a lot more grimy that whenever we actually start to walk in freedom than anybody, I think, really wants to admit, and we're going to see some of that griminess here in this next thing that we're about to go through. In Exodus chapter 5, verse 1 through 9, what we see is things get worse before they get better, so God promises freedom, and it's true. He sets us free, but it's a grimy process, and oftentimes things can get worse before they get better. That's what happens in Exodus. Look at the first nine verses in Exodus chapter 5. So it says, afterward, Moses and Aaron go to, and they, it says, they went and said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. They, they, then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. I just want to pause there and just say that's what the enemy wants for all of us. He wants us to live our lives underneath the burden. He wants us to stay underneath the weight. He wants us just to carry it. Carry it and just try to, as much as we can, act like it's not there. He says, get back to your burdens, and this is what the enemy wants from us. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. Man, I think it's just key comparing what God wants versus what the, uh, this Pharaoh, and, and uh, he's kind of um, the picture, uh, the symbol for whatever weight that you're carrying tonight, the symbol for whatever sin that has a hold on you, whatever hurt and pain has crushed you and caused you to have so much bitterness. This is what God says. So it says that you want them to rest from their burdens in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. It says, Jesus is speaking here, and he says, Come to me, all who are laboring and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus offers freedom. And this is what we're pressing into as we understand what it is to be unstuck and how do we live unstuck, and what does it practically look like to get unstuck? So things get worse before they get better, and we see this in verse 6. It says, the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves, but the number of bricks that they made in the past as their slave labor, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore, they cried, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. This is what Pharaoh says. So Israelites' burden actually becomes heavier after God promises freedom. That's a, that's a tough truth to try to wrestle with, but that's what happens. And I don't know if you've ever felt like that. But God says that he will free you and you start to follow Jesus and it just seems like things get harder than ever. It seems like uh, sometimes what we hear, what we hear is like this, this Disney version of the Christian life, this happily ever after version of the Christian life, um, that, uh, that we hear a testimony from somebody, and, and don't get me wrong, God can do this, and I've seen God do this in, in different circumstances, but someone will come up and they'll say, man, I was addicted to methamphetamines, 
And they'll share their story, and they'll go. And one time, the preacher was preaching, and, uh, and he talked about Jesus. And in that moment, I just said, I'm going to give this up, Jesus. I want you. And he, then they'll share their testimony and go, you know what? I don't even, I've never desired methamphetamines ever since. I've never, I, 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 don't, I have aversion to it now. I don't want it at all. And I, like I said, God can do that. And then, like, sometimes we just hear the testimony of the person that's like, you know, uh, I used to lust. I used to have a lust problem. And then the preacher said, stop it. I stopped it. Right then and there, no problems ever again. Never did again. Never again did I lust. And we hear the same story about smoking or whatever it is that you might want to throw in there. And it just seems like a, it's like you hear that. And if you're like me, you hear that and go, well, well, what about me? Because I'm still struggling. And I thought I did have Jesus in my life, but yet here I am still struggling. Listen, usually, usually this one and done thing is not how it happens when it comes to getting unstuck practically in our life. Now, God frees us from the chains and holds of sin on our life in a moment. Salvation happens in a moment. Sanctification, though, is a process of growing up in Jesus and getting free from so many things that had a hold on our lives. And so normally it's this grimy process, and things can actually get harder at first. Um, whenever whenever uh, I came back to the Lord after running from him and uh, going and diving into the party life. Uh, there's this weird thing that happened. Uh, I, had, I had all my friends that I could no longer hang out with. I tried. I'm going to share a little bit about that here in a second. But I tried to hang out with them, realized I was just too weak to not fall into um, getting drunk or getting high or whatever uh, was there um, that night. And uh, I, that through the pro- that happening several times and me stumbling several times, I realized I just needed some distance because I wasn't strong enough. Um, and, uh, and so I was there, I couldn't hang out with them, but at the same time, there was some church people that I knew, um, and just to be honest, I really didn't like them. I didn't like them that much at all, and so, uh, so I was stuck in this limbo where I didn't really like the church people um, that I knew, and, uh, and the party people I just couldn't go and, and hang out with, and so I was very lonely for a season, and in that sense, things got much more difficult for me, because I was sitting there going, okay, God, so I just have to sit at home alone on the weekends? And listen, that's what I did. And God used that, but it was not, it was not uh, an easy thing. It was a fight. And that's what it's like to get unstuck. It's a, it's a fight. I've talked with students that they have this powerful moment with God, and, and maybe they're listening to a worship song, or maybe they're hearing a message like I'm giving now, and, and they have this powerful breakthrough moment, and they're like, never again, Jesus. I don't want to fall into that ever again. I don't want to live in this unforgiveness and this hurt. I don't want to live in that ever again. And we have a true moment where we've kind of sensed that release and the freedom that Jesus offers, and, and then what happens? Then Thursday night comes, right? We say, I'm never going to do that again, except we do. And man, I think that this is most of us in the room. We've been there with different things in our lives. And so what happens is we go through this process where it's like this back and forth. Anybody been there? You've been in the back and forth struggle where you're like, never again. There I did it. Never again. There I did it. And we kind of, it's this, this struggle. And man, I think that's, that's actually pretty normal. So if there's anything to take cur- uh, encouragement in, at least take encouragement in the fact that that's what we see a lot when people are starting to get free. So don't quit in that phase. Keep on going. Keep fighting back. Keep striving forward after Jesus. I got a, a text from a student over the summer who said, uh, hey, I've had a couple of slip-ups starting a few days ago. By a couple, I mean two. And I've been doing well for the last three months. I just feel like I'm sliding a bit. It was on my phone, and the last time was last night. And then I responded to him, I'm praying for you, brother. Fight the good fight. It is a fight, but it is a good one. That's what, that's what scripture calls our faith. It's the good fight. Don't quit in the back and forth face. Keep on fighting the temptation that's coming at you and get back up and continue stumbling forward after, as you go after Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so it is this this. this enemy comes against us, and, and the enemies are sin. The enemies, the, the forces of evil, Satan and demons are real. If we're going to believe that God is real, we got to believe that that's real as well. And so there's a lot of things that, that come against us, our own temptation that comes against us. And listen, there's pushback from the enemy, and the enemy does not fight fair. That's something that we've got to know. When we're in that, when we're in that struggle, when you are saying yes to freedom in Jesus, we've got to know that there's pushback from the enemy, and the enemy does not fight fair as we go through some of the things that we are going through. Um, 
And what happens is, I don't know if you've ever been here, but you can start to experience a lot of doubt and a lot of frustration in your life. And uh, this is what happens with Moses whenever um, Moses is not seeing the freedom of God come like he wanted it to come. Um, he, he says this to God in Exodus chapter 5, verse 23. It says, for since I came to Pharaoh, and he's speaking directly to God, I, to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. I think it's worth reading that because Moses starts to doubt God. And sometimes when we're in this back and forth phase, we start to think, man, it, does God, will God really free me? And God can handle your doubts. Actually, we're going to cover doubt uh, as a topic um, here in just the, in the coming weeks. It's going to be uh, a, the topic that we dive into fully is doubt. And how does God respond to that and how do we fight through that? But he starts to doubt God. And so what do you do in those moments? What do I do in those moments whenever we're going through deep, deep struggle? One, I, I would start with saying that you push through as you hold on. Um, that you push through as you hold on. Um, my dad and I, whenever I would go and see him, growing up, we, he's a fisherman, and so we'd go fishing, and uh, we'd go to Lake Bardwell out by uh, Ennis, and so we would go and we'd fish, and um, one morning, my brother and I were in the boat, and uh, my dad and uh, his wife, Tracy, were in the boat, and they were at the front of the boat, we were at the back of the boat, um, and uh, we were all casting for sand bass, and so my, uh, my stepmom, uh, Tracy goes to cast, and so she zing, and then, and then she's kind of looking out because she's not seeing the bait go anywhere, and my dad, at the same time that she casts, goes, and he goes, hun, I think I know where your hook is, and the hook had buried itself into my dad's jaw completely, all the way, all the way to the very back, stuck, and I'm just looking at her, I'm like, you know, I was like that sloth on that one movie. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody? All right. I can't name the reference. What's the movie? There you go. Zootopia. All right. And so that's what I was like. I was like, what is going on? This is crazy. And so, and so I see my dad, and, and my dad has a couple of options at this, at this time. Actually, three options for what my dad is going to do. Um, my dad's like... Uh, Again, uh, just red, like I mentioned last week, uh, this is one of those. Red, this is when redneck starts to come out a little bit from the family. My dad said, "I ain't got time to go to the doctor," and I'm like, "There's a hook in your jaw, dude. There's literally, it's there. I don't here. here I can take a picture with my phone. Here, look. That's what's in your. That's in your face right now." And so, he goes, "No, I don't have time to go to the doctor." And so he takes it and he clips the. He clips the. Um, fishing line, and he clips the, the other two barbs on the hook, and then he clips the much as he can, um, as carefully as he can, and then he takes it, and my dad, he took it, and he pushed it through his jaw and pulled it out the other side. Um, here, but here's why I share that, because my dad had three options. My dad could either push it through, which it hurt, like I was watching it, and I was hurting. Like, I don't know how bad he hurt, but I know how bad I hurt, <laughs> and so it hurt. But so that was option one. The other option is that he could have actually pulled it back. And uh, there's a barb on those to keep it in a, in a fish's mouth, a fish mouth, fish's mouth, in the fish mouth. Um, what's wrong with me? And so it's supposed to keep the fish on the hook. And, uh, and so uh, pulling it back would have pulled all kinds of tissue out, uh, and it would have been a bad deal. Um, and so it would have been way worse if he would have pulled it out. And the other option would have been that he's like, this is how I'm living from now on. Call me Captain Hook. I, and so what would have happened if he would have kept, if someone would have kept a hook in their jaw, then that, of course infection would have taken place and ensued rather quickly. And so the, out of the three options, the only one that made sense was for him to have it pushed through the other side. And listen, it's same is true for us spiritually. Whenever you're in the moment um, and you're, you're in this back and forth phase when you feel like, man, am I going to get free? When you start to have these frustrations and you're trying with all that you got, you seem like you're going after God with all that you got, but things are getting worse and they're not getting better. Um, it's in those moments that you've got to push through because what are the other two options that you would go back that's going to hurt you more? Or that you, would, that you would just stay where you're at? Listen, and spiritual infection starts to spread. That's what happens, so we've got to push through, but we push through as we hold on, and that's the next point that we see in these scriptures is that we hold on to the promises of God. How do you get free? How do you walk in freedom? How do you get unstuck? You hold on to the promises of God, and this is in Exodus chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. 
Exodus chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, God tells his people to hold on. And he starts by reminding them of what he already said. He says, moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Sometimes we need to be reminded of what we already know when we're in our deepest, darkest moments. Is that not true? It says, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you. I will take you from slavery and bring you into freedom. With an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. You know what's so cool about this passage? You don't see this in the English language, but every place that you saw, I will do this and I will do that. Um, every single one of those places in the Hebrew Bible, that's actually written in the past tense. So God is telling them something in the past tense as if it already happened, though it hasn't happened yet. What God is saying is, listen, it has not happened yet, but I'm guaranteeing you victory in me. If you will hold on, I'm guaranteeing it. Though you have not seen it come to fruition yet, I'm guaranteeing that it's going to happen. Will we hold on to those things that God guarantees us? He guarantees us redemption. Will we hold on to that? Guarantee us that we can walk in freedom. Will we hold on to that? Man, I'm telling you, God is more powerful than what has power over you. Will we hold on to that? Will we hold on to that? You've got to hold on to the promises of God. Man, this is real stuff. And as we hold on to the promises of God, we cannot compromise. We can't compromise. When we're stuck in something, a lot of times what takes place next is we, we start to struggle and then we start to compromise. And we see this in eight, uh, uh, Exodus chapter 8, verse 25 and 26. The Pharaoh, the one who is placing the burden on the people, the one has, that has the people captive, he offers a deal of sorts. He offers a compromise. It says, Then Pharaoh said, uh, called Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, It would not be right for us to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. And so what he says, he says, Go sacrifice to your God in the land. What he just said is, I, I, want, you, I want you to stay as slaves but I also want you to worship God. How about we do that? And this is what happens so often in people's lives. They, they want God, but they're also enslaved to things in the world. And they want, they want to do both. They want to go after, and they want to try to have both. Man, I don't know if you've ever been there. I have. It just doesn't work out. It doesn't work out the way that the promise says it can. Like whenever he says, oh, you can do both, and that's not how it works. You stay a slave is what happens, and that's what he was offering them. He was saying, let's compromise. You can have both. And so how do we compromise? Maybe we compromise a lot of ways to have God and this world, to have God and have the thing that has a hold on us. Because can we be honest just for a second and admit that the things that have a hold on our lives, we kind of like them? That's why, we, that's why we struggle so much. Even with what I'm going to share at the end here, the bitterness that I held on to, kind of liked it. It was kind of a defense mechanism I've, I've come to learn. And, the, and, and uh, our, our sins, the, the sexual sin, the addiction, the things that we struggle with, we kind of like it. And that's why we struggle so deeply and so we compromise. And there's several ways that we compromise. Maybe you've thought one of these or all of these things. Um, maybe you've thought once a week isn't that big of a deal. I can control this. Maybe you've thought, ah, oh, well, it's college. I mean, it's college, I'm supposed to do these things. As you go and you ride with people that night that you know that y'all are about to get in some stuff that maybe God didn't want you to get into. We think, well, with pornography, I'll, I'll stop once I'm not single. I'll stop once I'm not single and then, then, then I'll, I'll, finally, I'll finally get kick this habit. Um, or I, I'll just look at the girls, uh, maybe you, you're further along in the process, you're thinking, oh, I'll just look at the girls on Instagram because they're not fully nude. These are things that I, I've, I've heard from people over and over again of the things that uh, cause them to compromise. Maybe this one's for you. This was, one for what was a big one for me. A little bit won't hurt. I know what my limit is. So this was something that I, I uh, struggled with for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and even months and months as I was getting out of the party lifestyle. Um, I had this deal within my own mind that I was like, okay, I can, I can go to the party and hang out with all my friends and uh, I, I won't have any. 
I won't have any, and then I wouldn't have any, and it was really, really tough, and then I'd, and then I'd think in my mind, ah, oh, well, okay, well, the next week I would think, okay, well, I'll just have three or four, um, never mind that I was not legal drinking age, um, and so I was like, I'll just have three or four, and that night I would have three or four too many, and I would have more like 12 to 15 beers, and I would be just hammered drunk with everybody else. And this process happened over and over and over again because I just kept on telling myself, I, I can do this. I know what my limit is. And maybe you're in a struggle like that, and I'm telling you, that's the struggle that I went through. And maybe you can learn something from the thing that I was believing. A little bit won't hurt something that we believe in. Maybe, maybe you've said this, uh, at least I'm not as bad as I used to be. Listen, guys, Jesus did not come to this earth and die for you so he could make you not as bad as you used to be. He came and died for you to set you free and make you new. So don't settle. Don't settle for not as bad as I used to be. Don't settle for less than full freedom in Jesus. And so what do you do whenever you have these thoughts and these temptations and the things that are, you're, you're stuck in? What do you do to fight those to not compromise? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13 are going to be very, very clear. It says, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall, meaning we all have things that we could fall into. Anyone. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Just around this room, there are exit signs all around this room. And what God just said is, listen, in temptation, there's always going to be an exit sign. you got to take the exit sign. And I don't know what that exit sign needs to be for whatever it is for you, but you need to learn to take the exit so you don't have a lot of pain in your life and a lot of remorse in your life, and you can walk in the freedom of God many, 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 many days in your life. And so you don't compromise, but you find the exit sign. And finally, we got to know this, and this is what the whole message is leading to, and what's true for every person in here is ultimately God fights for you. If you are a believer in Jesus, God fights for you. And we see this in Exodus chapter um, 14. Verses 11 through 14, this is after the plagues and Pharaoh lets the people go. And then after he lets the people go, he then um, turns and he chases and he goes after them and to kill them and to wipe them off the map. And they see the armies, the most powerful armies in the world at this time coming at them. And this is what the people say. And this is how God responds. Um, he says, they said to Moses, this people seeing the armies coming after them, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? meaning we're toast, we're done. Look at them, they're about to kill us all. What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. God comes, um, the Pharaoh comes after the people and goes after the people hardest when they're closest to freedom. And so often things get most difficult right on the brink of breakthrough when you're close to freedom in our lives as well. And it says in verse 13, And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. God will fight for you. When I was, when I was stuck in my truck in the mud, the only thing that got me out was someone else had to come and they had to tie the winch to my truck and they had to slowly but surely pull me out of the pit that I was in. And Jesus comes to us and slowly but surely he starts to pull us out of the pits that we've been stuck in in our lives. This is what God does with us. And so maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking like, listen, I can't free myself from the shame that I carry. Jesus can. I can't free myself from the bitterness uh, that, I, that I have and the hold of sin on my life. Jesus can. I can't free myself from the addiction that has a hold on me. Jesus can. Whatever it is that you are stuck in, Jesus can free you. Jesus can. And Jesus does. Jesus does for us what we could never do for ourselves. This is the God that we serve. It's not a pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and you make it happen. No, it's God has freed you and you can walk in his freedom on a day in, day out basis. Jesus sets us free. Um, on my forearm, I have the tattoo to Telestai. And it's the last thing that Jesus says on the cross as he's dying. Um, he says, it is finished. It's three words in English. It's one word in the Greek language. But he says, to Telestai, it is finished. The debt has been paid. The war is won. Listen, guys, we can fight the battle knowing that the war is won by Jesus. That's good news. We can fight the battle knowing that Jesus has won the war 
on the cross, setting us free. God frees us. And as we close tonight and as the band comes up, I have uh, a couple of buckets, uh, jars with uh, pennies in them. And uh, this uh, represents me and every single one of these pennies represents a day, a day that I've walked in the freedom of Jesus. Um, a couple years ago, just over two years ago, um, my, I, I realized and God brought to my attention that I had held in a lot of bitterness towards my dad. Um, bitterness towards the times that he wasn't at the football game when he said he was going to show up. Bitterness towards the time that I was sitting there waiting for him to pick me up um, on my front porch and he doesn't, doesn't show, calls my mom, says I'm not coming again. Bitterness just because he said, oh, son, I'm going to come and I'm going to see you. And then he doesn't come and, he see, and see me. This happened over and over again in my life, and I, and I thought I'd forgiven him, but I realized that I actually had a lot of bitterness in my life. And a couple years ago, I actually wrote my dad a letter, and I gave it to him. And that was a pivotal moment for me because I've been walking in freedom in a way that I didn't know I could. I didn't realize that that bitterness actually leaks out on other people. I didn't realize that that bitterness that I had wasn't, wasn't a place where it just stays compartmentalized to just my dad. And so every one of these is a day since then. Last couple of years, a day that I've walked in freedom from Jesus, from that sin in Jesus, from the sin of bitterness, following after God. Every one of these days is just a day that I have just said, Jesus, I'm going to choose you today. Every one of these things is really important to me because this is a day that I have more of God in my life and less of that stuff. And little by little, I just experienced so much of Jesus because I've said no to the bitterness and I've just decided that I'm going to forgive my dad. This represents the day about a year ago when my dad said, hey, when you come into town, son, I'm going to see you. And I called my dad and he didn't answer again. I had a choice. Was I going to, all those emotions started to come back and I had to say, no, I'm going to forgive my dad. And I love my dad. I hope that he comes to know the Lord, but this is just more and more freedom that I've been able to live in with God over two years, over 730 days. I've been able to walk in freedom to what Jesus has. This jar represents Trevor, our college associate pastor. Trevor came to me when he was a junior in high school and, said, and uh, I was the one that he told. I was his youth pastor. He said, hey, I, I'm addicted to pornography. And after that day, Trevor, the, through the power of the Lord, he started to walk in freedom. And he's been up for seven years, two months. Walked in freedom. And over and over again, he just started to see days and days and days where he got to walk in the freedom that Jesus has to offer. And he's just, man, months and months. Now he's married and he doesn't have the secret sin that's attached to him. He's just over and over again, just be able to walk in the freedom of Jesus. Guys, Jesus sets people free. Jesus sets people free. This was the day. This represents the day that he uh, got a new phone. And he didn't have any blockers on his phone. And that night he had every opportunity to go in to look at pornography, but he said no, because he knew that the freedom of Jesus was better. And man, he has just continued for seven years, two months, 2,000, over 2,615 days, he's walked in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Jesus sets people free. Don't tell me that God can't set you free. You can walk in freedom. There's a couple things I wanna mention about why I'm using pennies. Abraham Lincoln was the liberator of the slaves. And Jesus is the liberator of our lives. And on the penny, it says, in God we trust. We can trust that God is going to set us free. And it's on, it represents one, one day at a time. Tomorrow we get a chance to walk in freedom. Tomorrow, it's one day. You trust God one day, the liberator one day at a time, and you start to walk days and days and days, and then years and years and years, and then a lifetime of freedom in Jesus. Let's pray. God. Thank you that you set us free. In your heart, as it just between you and the Lord right now, would you just would you say this in your heart to God? Would you say, God, help me walk in your freedom in my life? God, help me walk in your freedom. 
if you're here and you don't know Jesus, Jesus wants to set you free now. Set you free from all the sin that's weighing on you. He died for you so you could live for him. He defeated the grave by rising three days later so you could have a relationship with him. And if you're here tonight and you do not know Jesus, you can just say this in your heart. You can say, Jesus, save me. Make me new. I repent of my sins, God. And I turn to you. Thank you for dying for me. In your name, Jesus.